Thank you for that beautiful anthem. I love that. I love that anthem. I can never hear it too many times. And perfect for this morning, for the beauty of the earth. We all know it. We know that we live on a God-blessed planet. We are truly blessed. It's beyond any lottery you could possibly uh, configure. You know, we are, it's not luck, it's, it's a blessing. It's a miracle. It's a it's an incredible gift that we've been given, and we each know it, I think, deep down inside. Even if we don't believe in God, we know we have been truly given a gift. And so in the presence of, of God's people, we contemplate our responsibility and our role in caring for this incredible world that we inhabit. I want us to turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 21 where we read Paul's reflections on the healing of the world and the longing that our planet, our world has for redemption and healing. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's about to be revealed to us. And of course, Paul's thinking right now of the return of Christ, and he's thinking of the healing of the world, the risen Lord coming and uh, reclaiming all uh, of this world for himself. And and so he goes on to say, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation itself will be set free from its enslavement to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The freedom of the glory of the children of God. The creation longing for for that healing that comes with the healing of of God's people. And I want us to also look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, where we read these ancient words. The Lord God took the, the Adam, the one who was taken from the earth, the man, literally, and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And we know that that word keep means to protect to till it and to keep it. Lord, we thank you for this calling, not just to use the world, but to protect the world. It's a divine calling that comes from you, and we pray, Lord, that we might rise up and step into that calling as children of the risen Christ. Lord, speak to us again through your Holy Spirit, fill us with your strength, whether we're online this morning and we're listening from our homes or whether we're here in the sanctuary, unite us together in your spirit and in your word today. Speak, your servants are listening. Amen. I was born in Princeton, New Jersey, but I've lived most of my life in L.A., and how many of you would be able to say the same? You live most of your life here. I, I really consider myself a native Californian. And if you've lived as many years as I have, or more, you definitely remember the 70s, or the 60s, uh, or the 50s, when you would walk out, and I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, and the mountains would disappear in the summer, completely disappear. And I lived in the foothills in Burbank, and from Burbank High School, where I would try to run in August, I could not see the mountains. They were completely blanked out. The Verdugos were gone. Now, I'm, I'm so happy to say that today in August, that would not be true. I would be able to get out there, and because of the Air Quality Management District, we've cut air pollution by a pretty astounding amount, even though we still have a high amount of air pollution here. But when in international student fellowship gatherings, I've talked with people from other countries, I know that even today, they're experiencing worse pollution in their cities than we are experiencing here in in the city of Los Angeles, which is hard for me to imagine. I didn't need to be convinced to take care of the earth or to try to cut air pollution. I knew it as I was breathing that stuff in 
and we would have our smog days, and, uh, and I knew it was doing harm to me. So that was enough to, to, to convince me to, to do more and to be a, a caretaker of the earth, just as, as one who was a follower of Jesus. But it did remind me of a scene, maybe you remember it, a scene from the movie Evan Almighty, where God, who's played by Morgan Freeman, he does a great job of playing God, uh, he's trying to convince Evan that uh, he is going to be part of his plan to rescue his town from a, a flood of biblical proportions. And Evan isn't quite sure yet whether he's God. So um, Morgan Freeman, who plays God, takes Evan out and he shows him this beautiful valley that he doesn't recognize. Let's see if we can play that little clip right now. So how about it? Feel like living on the earth? Beautiful, isn't it? I remember creating this valley. Notice how the mountains line up east to west. I suppose there'd be lots of sunshine. Well, <laughs> don't recognize it, eh? Well, this is where you live, son. This is Prestige Press. I wanted you to see the original design. Did you catch what he said there at the end? The, the dialogue's a little hard. He said, I wanted you to see the original design. I wanted you to see the original design. I think they were really thinking about the San Fernando Valley right there, mountains east to west, yeah, or, uh, or any other part of the valley. But yeah, I wanted you to see the original design, he said. I love that line. Not just the concrete and the housing developments, but the beauty of the creation that God, that God has made. Paul writes one day, Paul writes that one day the creation itself will be set free from this bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Wow. Freedom from the bondage of decay. The freedom of the glory of the children of God. I'm fascinated by this idea that somehow the revealing of God's children, that is the, the children of God taking their, their rightful place, is also good news for creation. It's good news for creation, that when we're stepping into our role as God's children, we're also bringing a blessing to the earth, says the Apostle Paul. And this idea wasn't invented by Paul. Back, the prophet Hosea, in chapter 2, verse 18, declared, the Lord says, I will make for you a covenant, says the Lord, with the wild animals, the birds of the air, and the creeping things of the ground, and I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land. God has a better future in mind for planet Earth. God has a better future in mind for you and me. And redemption is not only the redemption of our spirits and souls, as God's people, as the children of the earth, but it's also the redemption and the healing of, of the world, of the earth. Our risen Lord is, is the first fruits, you might say, of that promise, the one who rose from the dead, who took upon himself all the darkness and the hate and the destructive impulses of humankind upon himself, and he defeated it on the third day. He rose from the dead. He is the one who said to Lazarus, arise and come forth from the grave. And in the same way, he's, he wants to liberate us, you and me, from the evil impulses and the hatreds and the selfishness that cause not just pain to each other, but also cause pain to the earth. That's a, that's a theme that's actually throughout the scriptures. Because caring for God's creation is a, is a moral and spiritual responsibility. And so because of that, I want us to think about what that entails. Um, and I'm, I'm drawing in many ways from uh, 
the, the, the fruits of the Spirit that are listed in Paul's letter to the Galatians, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I want us to think about how those can be played out in our role as caretakers of the earth. Let's just think about that for a few minutes. And the first call, I think, is to love God's creation faithfully. To love God's creation faithfully. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Very good. As part of the creation narrative recorded in Genesis, humans received this special commission to take care of God's good creation. It's a commission to not just dominate the earth, but to protect the earth. I think the idea of dominion is important because it recognizes the fact that we have this power. Uh, when Genesis says that we have dominion over the earth, it's, it's stating a fact. It's stating a fact about our power. And what we do with that power is what's so, that's the moral question. What we do with that power. And the, the commission to take care of the earth uh, and to, to steward the earth, you might say, is one that the Bible says we've abandoned, that our impulsive nature, our, our selfishness, and our tendency to look out for our own interests, not the, not the interests of others, as, as Paul says in the book of Philippians, which I'll be preaching on beginning next week, uh, is, is not just damaging our relationships with each other, but it's also damaging our relationships with the earth. I'm sure you've heard about the, the two swirling currents of garbage in the Pacific Ocean, in which there are, are millions of tons of plastic from two continents that are trapped and they're carried by birds and wildlife who think it's food and who feed it to their young and thousands of birds every year are, are, are being killed just by feeding off the plastic that's swirling out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And maybe you've seen the posted signs warning us not to swim in the water after storm runoff has carried hazardous waste into our oceans feeding the growth of toxic algae and bacteria. There's actually one of those signs posted right now down at Mother's Beach, which is no surprise down in the marina, not one of the cleanest parts of the marina. And uh, our little group of guys that rose down there, we walk right by it into the water. And I guess, I think what we, we rationalize is, is that the sign says don't swim. So we're like, okay, we're not swimming. So. We're just wading, right? It doesn't say don't wade into the water. It says don't swim. And so we, we, uh, we get away with that every, every week. <laughs> but John 3.16 affirms that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that word, lo uh, world, is such a powerful word. It actually, the Greek word is cosmos. God so loved the cosmos that he gave his one and only son. And it refers to the entire created order, as Paul was saying earlier. The whole creation longs to be set free. And, and John says God loves the whole cosmos enough to give his only son for us. So we know that God cares about, you know, wayward people and the destruction that wrecks uh, havoc on our relationships as human beings. But does God really care about the other stuff, the rest of the world? Does God only care about people? Is redemption only about saving people? Does God really care about this creation, which Genesis says God considered to be not just good, but really good? Like, this is some of my best work. And we've managed to foul the oceans, pollute the skies, cause the suffering of animals and creatures of the earth. Does God care about that? The Bible says that we are to love God's creation faithfully. And here's another thought, that we are to enjoy God's creation 
Psalm 104 says, May the Lord rejoice in his works. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. Scriptures invite us to share in God's joy over creation. God rejoices over the things that he has made. Should we also rejoice, celebrate the world, the creation that God has made? It speaks of how God made wind and fire, mountains and valleys. Read it. Read the whole psalm. It's amazing. Gushing springs, which cause grass and trees to grow, which make home for birds and animals. And it concludes, as I just read, may the Lord rejoice in his works, and I, for myself, will sing to the Lord as long as I live. It's almost like the psalmist is saying, wow, you must just When you look at what you've made, you must just rejoice and celebrate this incredible thing that you've done. And by extension, you must be very sad when you see what we've done to it. So God intends for us to enjoy, not destroy, what he's made. Whether it's a starry night or a beautiful ocean sunset or a hike into the mountains or the artistry of a single tree leaf, It is a powerful spiritual discipline to meditate upon the natural world. From the smallest little uh, DNA molecule, you know, to to the starry sky swirling, the galaxy swirling in, in, in our head, above our heads. How many of you got to see the eclipse a couple days ago? Any of you travel and see the total solar eclipse? Yeah, we were talking about that. I really believe that the total solar eclipse is a sign. It's a, it's a sign from God of the special place we have in our galaxy and in our universe because of the alignment of the moon. The distance of the moon relative to the distance of the earth is not just a nice fact. It's also one of the reasons why there's life. Because the moon helps to control our seasons. And our distance from the sun is why we have photosynthesis and and plants and animals and oxygen. So that total solar eclipse reminds us again of the precise alignment and place that we have. This incredible place that we have in the universe. It's a place of blessing. And it should produce awe and gratitude. Praise God for the creation and our place in it. And thirdly, we are to be at peace with God's creation. The intentional harming of creation is a kind of a warfare, but with the peace of God, that warfare has come to an end, or it should come to an end as that peace grows in us, the shalom of God, the salam of God. Think of the destruction of the rainforest of the Amazon and the poverty which makes that destruction seem necessary to those who are living there. J.D. Hare, former president of the National Wildlife Federation, told this story. He said, about four years ago, my daughter, Whitney, was very ill with cancer. She literally came within a few days of death. She's here today and cured. Why? He goes on to say the drug that saved her life was derived from a plant called the rosy periwinkle, which is a plant native to the island of Madagascar. It comes from the rainforest. The irony is that 90% of the forested area of Madagascar has been destroyed and their potential values forever. And I did some research on the rosy periwinkle. Not only is it beneficial for cancer therapy, it also lowers blood pressure and blood glucose levels. An amazing plant that comes from a part of the world that's being threatened by environmental destruction. There's There's treasures in the world, in in the natural world, that should be appreciated just for themselves. But it is helpful to remember they are also incredible gifts that God 
has provided for you and for me. The point is that when we hurt the natural world and the creatures that inhabit it, we are actually hurting ourselves as well. We're part of it. And in Mark 1.13, we read that Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days with no one, uh, no one to be his companion except the angels, and then it says, and the wild beasts. If Jesus could live at peace in the wilderness, maybe we could learn how to live in harmony rather than in enmity with the creation as well. And number four, I want to say from Paul's fruits of the Spirit, maybe we could learn patience from the natural world. Maybe we could learn patience from the natural world. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. One of the great Sabbath lessons from God's creation can teach us is patience. God's creation can teach us to go slow. The cycle of the seasons, the growth of plants and animals take time. They can't be rushed. And if you look at the natural world, you can't help but slow down. If you've taken any time out in the wilderness, any length of time, you know that when you return, the world seems very fast. You know, as you're driving down a freeway or, you know, the rush of just daily life. Being in the natural world, it lowers our blood pressure It creates a sense of peace and calm. If you stand out at the ocean and you're surrounded by that, the the sound, the the rush and the the ambient noise of the ocean currents and the beauty of those rolling waves coming in, you feel yourself calming down. And it reminds us that the advance of God's kingdom takes time. It reminds us to slow down. But Jesus reminds us that it's steadily growing in influence and power, and our role in this world as well may seem to take time. It may seem very slow. It may seem like what we're doing as God's people here at St. John's is just incremental in its effects. But God works over millennia, not just minutes, and he works in this moment right now, right here through you and me. And if you spend time with the Lord, I think you're going to enter into his pace and his timing and his peace. And that peace is something that we can also give to one another and to the natural world around us that we love and care for. I've learned from the natural world to to slow down and to savor every moment and to enjoy the creation, to be at peace with it, but also to learn from it. And fifthly, we're to show kindness and gentleness towards God's creation. The Christian social reformer William Wilberforce, who died in 1833, is best known for his work to abolish slavery. And I'm sure you've probably read about William Wilberforce or you have uh, seen that film, beautiful film about his life. But not a lot of people know that he helped found the Royal Society of the Prevention for Cruelty to Animals. The first such organization in the world. And its initial focus was to um, address cruelty to farm animals, but then it extended to address animal experimentation, animal welfare, and animal rights. And that was the work of, of the Christian social reformer William Wilberforce. That's part of our heritage. At the end of the book of Jonah, God speaks of his concern for Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left. This is the very last sentence of the book of Jonah. And then there's this surprise phrase you don't expect. 120,000 persons who don't know their right hand from their left and also many animals. And also many animals. Wow, I love that. God counts the animals too. They count. And they count to us. They have to. We have to ask ourselves if the killing of animals for sheer entertainment or the cruelty of animal testing by cosmetic companies, which is not required by the FDA, 
or the shameful way the animals are treated in factory farms reflects the gentleness of the Savior who spent moments in the wilderness with only the wild beasts as his companions. Conversion to environmental concern. Hmm. Pope Francis had this to say, and I think he had some really powerful things to say, and I'm going to quote him as a Presbyterian. He wrote, Conversion to environmental concern entails a loving awareness that we are not disconnected from the rest of creatures, but we are joined in a splendid universal communion. As believers, we do not look at the world from outside, from without, but from within. Conscious of the bonds with which the Father has linked us to all beings. It's a powerful statement. It's written in an encyclical called On Care for Our Common Home. And finally, sixthly, we are to practice self-control as a member of God's new creation. Changing our ways will require tremendous self-control. It's the last of the fruits of the Spirit. A fruit of the Spirit and a mark of the new creation because true self-control and change of our behavior comes when we recognize, when we admit our own sin, our own selfishness, our own complacency, and we ask Christ to fill us with the self-control of his spirit, the self-control that this world needs. The only way the world is going to be healed by the children of God before Christ returns and to experience healing is as we begin to be more like him. And part of the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of self-control. It's saying that not everything that we can do should we do. Pope Francis again wrote, Christian spirituality proposes an alternative understanding of the quality of life and encourages a prophetic and contemplative lifestyle, one capable of deep enjoyment, free of the obsession with consumption. We need to take up an ancient lesson found in different religious traditions and also in the Bible. It is a conviction that less is more, that less is more. The simplicity of the Savior. So, today, concern for the environment is actually not a back burner issue. I read about a Pew research poll that found in, in 2022, 80% of religiously affiliated Americans agree with the idea that God gave humans a duty to protect and care for the earth, including plants and animals. And the vast majority of that religious community is the Christian community. 80% believe that that is a role that God has given us, a duty to protect and care for the earth. And in our own Presbyterian church, uh, we are working toward this idea of calling congregations as communities to care for the earth together. Not just individually, but actually together in some very practical ways. And that was one of the things that Jim was alluding to and there are some beautiful ways that we can think about doing that, which I won't talk about today, but I do think it's, it's worthy of our attention as a congregation. John said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and the Holy Spirit is teaching us to love the world as our creator loves the world and anticipation of his glorious return. We've been given the work to do in preparation for his coming, work that includes the stewardship and care of his world. May God give us the wisdom to, in our time and place, as stewards of the earth, to do our part, to love the creation, to rejoice in God's creation to learn from God's creation, to practice self-control and to protect and be good stewards of this earth, the earth which God said is very good.
good. Amen. Let's take a moment to reflect on the Word of God in this time of silent meditation. By the way, if you're ever up in Oregon and you can drop by Silver Falls State Park, 10 waterfalls within less than five miles. It's an incredible hike. I encourage you to do it someday. Let's pray this prayer of response. Lord of all creation, on this day of rest, we cease from our work so that we may truly honor and marvel at your works. For you created the heavens and the earth spoke time and space into existence, and patiently prepared a world for us to inhabit and to care for. Therefore, we confess and turn from those things that have added to the pollution, distortion, and destruction of the creation, creatures, and people that you have made. Forgive us, dear God. By faith, we receive the love offered to us through your Son, who came to heal our relationship with you, with each other, and with the earth. Fill us, therefore, with the Spirit of Christ, that we might bless, liberate, protect, cooperate with, and enjoy the world you intended to restore and redeem. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final hymn, This is My Father's World.